I'd like to welcome you and say good evening and welcome to the Virtual Women's Club for the third week of Meet the Artist. My name is Augusta Supple and I'd like to begin by acknowledging that this evening we're all meeting on Aboriginal land. I'm calling in from the land of the Wongal and Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, which has only recently been known as Dulwich Hill. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians for their connection to and care of country, which has existed for more than 60,000 years. I acknowledge this deep connection to country, to the waterways, to the birds, animals and plants, and that are celebrated through practice of culture, of song, of dance and storytelling. I'd like to acknowledge that this country was never ceded and that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Here we are inside the Virtual Women's Club this evening and I'd like to thank our members and guests for joining us for this brand new initiative of the club, TWC Meets the Artist. Aligning with the founders' vision of the Women's Club as a place to fill some of the needs of intellectual and academic women by offering mental and artistic enjoyment, the Meet the Artist program is part of the club's COVID-19 digital arts and cultural program. This program was developed in response to the July 2021 COVID-19 lockdown with its aim to celebrate women in the arts through providing paid opportunities to hear about their practices and their career and inspiration, to keep community and connection with like-minded people and essentially to keep thinking women away from boredom. The next, the Meet the Artist series takes place three times a week, Monday, Wednesday and Friday nights from 6 to 6.30 and each week we have a different art form or theme. It's an opportunity for members of the Women's Club and the broader public to get to know the artists in our communities. Artists are asked to either choose to be in conversation or to deliver a Pecha Kucha style PowerPoint presentation as by way of introduction to their work. Um, and tonight ends our special focus on theatre performers with the iconic and legendary Australian actress and crossword enthusiast Belinda Giblin. <laughs> Belinda Giblin is one of Australia's most distinguished stage and screen actors and her most recent theatre credits include Samuel Beckett's Happy Days for Redline Theatre at the Old Fitzroy Theatre, John at House Theatre Company, Ear to the Edge of Time, Sport for Jove, Doubt at the Old Fitz, Fitz for which she was nominated for Best Actress in an Independent Production by the Sydney Theatre Critics Awards in 20, 2019. She's yeah. also performed in Blonde Poison at the Old Fitz, the Opera House and the MTC at the Lawler for which she was nominated for Best Actress in an independent production by Sydney Theatre Critics Circle Awards in 2015. Other plays include Family Values and the Turquoise Elephant, Wicked Sisters and Love Child, which she also produced at the Griffin Theatre, Daylight Saving for Eternity Play Playhouse, Dark Voyager, Absurd Sing Person Singular, and Noises Off for the Ensemble Theatre at the Opera House, two sellout national tours of the Shoehorn Sonata with Maggie Kirkpatrick, the Vagina Monologues, Away at the Sydney Theatre Company, Blythe Spirit, same time another year for Perth Theatre Company, three national tours of steaming, social <laughs> climbers, henceforward, how the other half loves and canary sometimes sing at the Marion Street Theatre, Quadrophenia, and the world is made of glass at the Playbox Theatre in Melbourne. You might also recognise her for some of her television roles. Belinda has played regular roles for Sons and Daughters, Good Guys, Bad Guys, MDA for the ABC, Heartbreak High, Skyways, The Sullivans, A Country Practice in the Box. And most recently, Belinda has been known by international and national audiences as Martha Stewart, the long presumed dead wife of <laughs> in <Lovely. Southern> Way. <laughs> Belinda's film credits include On the Edge of Bed, Peterson, The Box, Demolition, End Play, The Empty Beach, Say What You Want Me and also Alvin Purple. Um, and she's just completed an independent feature film with the working title, A Stitch in Time. And I'd also like to say that she's not afraid to be in a, in a web series either. Um, and she was in Bent 101 you know, a couple of years ago. Oh, and in her other job, Belinda also works as a corporate trainer, executive coach and speech writer. And she manages to do the cryptic crossword. So Belinda, thank you so much for making it to the Virtual Women's Club this evening. And thank you for joining me. My pleasure. I must be terribly old listening to all those credits. I think I've had a 
rather long life. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been quite. You've put these been, on. Yes, you, you quite, I've lost my vanity. Mm. Oh, is that good? It's probably oh, behind the couch. Um, <laughs> but you, you've, you're a very highly energetic person, and you've done a lot of you've done a lot of work and that's that's not even touching on some of the things that I thought we could mention. Um, Belinda, um, I'm going to start off with just a little bit of a scene setting here. You grew up in Tamworth, the daughter yes. of an obstetrician and your mother was very involved in the local dramatic society. So both your parents were really people of the theatre in their own right, wouldn't you say? Yes, I, I think my father was a very busy doctor and he, he delivered most of the children in Tamworth in my time there. But he was also a frustrated thespian and so appeared in all that. You know, Tamworth in those days, and I'm talking about the 50s and 60s because I'm 71 now, um, it was it was a hub of musical theatre. And, I mean, there's a conservatorium of music up there. It was, it was Arts Council came through. Um, there was uh, operetta and opera and all sorts of things. And my father sang in all those Gilbert and Sullivan shows. We, we learned them off by heart as kids. So, and my mother was acting or directing in the local theatre. So, yes, I was surrounded. I was surrounded and supported by it throughout my entire um you know childhood and adolescence uh and was wonderful I mean it was rich a rich artistic uh environment to be perfectly honest but you were also quite an academic child and so if you think about you know what where this all began for you you know you were you're were academic you're quite you were quite sporty is what you've told me in the past as well <laughs> So, so can you tell me a little bit about how you, how you made your, your brilliant career, I suppose? Uh, well, look, one of the things I think is, yes, I was surrounded from very uh, early on by people interested in the arts and theatre. Um, we had music playing all the time. We had operas playing. Uh, my father sang. I played piano. I did ballet, all of those things. I was a terrifically high achiever I would think and encouraged I suppose by my parents I had two elder brothers and a younger sister and um we were all we were all hugely encouraged to be uh, every uh, to reach our potential all of us uh, and and the other thing is there was never a sense of I'm a girl and my brothers are boys and they're going to be better off so I grew up being a rather self-determined uh, self-determining uh, young woman um, and never felt that there was any kind of limit to what I could do. I was, a, uh, as I said, you said I was an academic, very, very, very highly motivated to do well and to be good at everything. So debating and sport and, and academics, uh, you know, it was, it was hugely important to me and still is, strangely enough, it's the driver that makes my life, um, I mean, I'm, I'm satisfied by a lot of things, but it's also very painful to be a, a driven human being as I am. But uh, I suppose it's better than being a slob. I guess, I, <laughs> I, I, guess, slob. So. I guess so. We wouldn't know, um, <laughs> really, would we, Belinda? But I think, you know, there, there was also a moment, there was a huge motivating factor maybe to, to be able to move from Tamworth and to move to Sydney and oh yeah about that sort of point in time for you if you could paint well the there was never a question that I was going to leave Tamworth which was a small place <laughs> and go into the big time and I always wanted to be an actor but you know in those days we all went to university everyone it was understood that if we had a brain that we would go to university and get a degree of some sort medicine or arts or whatever and in those days, of course, we were financed by the government. We were all on scholarships and, and it was free. So I went to Sydney University and did an arts degree. And, um, but I never had any intention of using that arts degree for anything other than my going, being an actor because that's what I wanted to do. And I went to NIDA and spent three years there. I didn't, I didn't graduate from NIDA because I got off in a matlock down in... Um, 
Melbourne in the Crawford stables, who, and of course Hector Crawford, the avuncular Hector Crawford ran a mighty ship in Melbourne. He had about five or six shows going, Division Four, Homicide, Matlock, um, Carson's Law, The Sullivans, The Box, of course I was in, all of those shows just one after the other. Those were the days. And we just, and we just went. I mean, I went to NIDA and um, um, I, I'm very glad I did. Um, but I left a little prematurely on the advice of, um, of John Clark, who ran NIDA in those days. He said, look, go out there, trial and error, school of hard knocks. That's the way you'll learn anything. Uh, so he was quite happy happy for me to leave um but also I was lucky and I I was a lucky I mean I had a modicum of talent I suppose but I was lucky and this business is 50 uh, percent luck it really is being in the right place at the right time you've got to back it up with a, a bit of talent but you know it's it's where you land every time and you've got to keep being in there, being in the game, being in the game. You can't yeah. sit back in this business if you want any kind of longevity. I'm going to stop talking now. No, I don't think you should. And I also think that it's it's quite interesting because I think when you landed in Sydney, Belinda, you were also, uh, you took up residence at the Women's College. I did the best days of my life. Gosh, it was, you know, Tamworth, a lot of the kids who came from the country towns, of course, went to the colleges. So I lived, and don't forget, this was during the Vietnam War, and and surely we were all very political, and and it was flower power and hippydom. And I sat at the foot of these guru type students who talked philosophy and rubbish most of the time in <laughs> retrospect, but fun. And it was, you know, I was a naive. 17 year old and and was in the big smoke and women's college I mean I was on campus I was living in the middle of Sydney it couldn't have been a better entree into the I think I was telling the other day I was sent down on my first night at women's college because it was orientation week and I thought you were meant to have men in your room and the, Miss Langley the principal at the time um, she, what is called, and what was called in those days, she sent me down. I was sent, I was sent down for having a man in my room. And she wrote to my parents and said, this is not good behaviour. I was completely innocent, of course. My mother said this, it wrote a letter back to me and said, this is a blot on the escutcheon <laughs> that I, I had let down the family. <laughs> The rest of the students, the senior students, spoke to her and said, don't do that to her. She's only been here a day. I, I had a wonderful time at Women's College. Gosh, it was good. A wonderful, wonderful place. And I loved being a student at university. It was, you know, from Tamworth and a naive 17-year-old, I have to say, to, to, to be introduced to Sydney through Women's College was a, was a luxury, really. Hmm. Well, there's there's a long, strong history, I think, between the Women's College and the Women's Club, which is kind of quite nice um, to, to make that link. Yes. I yeah. think I think it's also you're, you're touching on a few things about your sort of naivety or your, your youngness <laughs> when you were, were 17. Um, and then, of course, you went to NIDA and then everything sort of blossomed from there. And this was an era of Australian sort of filmmaking, which was kind of um i'm going to call it sexy i'm going to say that there was a, a big focus on you know a liberation of sorts um and there was this huge sort of celebration i suppose can yeah. you can you as a as a thinking intellectual woman <laughs> how, how are you um what what was that era like for you well, don't, this was the era of women's liberation. This was the era when we were all burning our bras and and the pill and we were able to be promiscuous. I mean, far more promiscuous than my daughter's generation, for example, uh, which I think is, you know, 
much more difficult actually than it was for us it was a it was a period of liberation and it was also a period of taboo breaking so the television shows that were on like 96 and the box of course i was in the box for a year um that was all about breaking taboos homosexuality first came on television lesbianism well that's the same thing really but i mean it, uh people but nudity god knows i think i was bare topped in that show more than once um and it was a it was an interesting time because we did it in a way that was quite i'm going to say naive because i was taking my top off on television in the box for example and and being a, a sexy little thing and you know here here i was come from Tamworth a little nerd uh, and with no experience at all of that kind of with no sexual awareness at all and suddenly I, I sort of blossomed as this you know sexy little thing and so it wasn't unwilling I didn't go into it uh, in any sort of unwilling way I went into it in a very naive way and it was fine to do that um, and of course in retrospect, I look back and I think all those people who interviewed me and those execs and all those people, I mean, in light of the Me Too movement now, I didn't recognise that that was going on. I certainly was never uh, in a position where I had to defend myself or, you know, I, I, was, I was never harassed. But it was the innuendo was certainly there. And that certainly was happening, but I think it was a different time to now because people were doing a lot of things you would not dare to do now. And it was kind of uh, fine. We laughed it off perhaps. And maybe that's not a good thing, but we, mm. we sort of laughed it off. I, I have to say I was never in a position where I was in any sort of danger but it certainly was those things were happening but we were unaware that it was a thing or I was unaware that it was a thing I look at it now and think oh dear <laughs> you know, um, I think we've come a long way since then but I, I have to say you're asking me about that time it was a very promiscuous time but I never felt exploited that's I really, never really I felt exploited in a, in a um, an intellectual way because I wasn't a blonde bimbo with big boobs. I was the same person I was uh, at, at school. I was a, a, a nerdy academic mm -hmm. and I was smart and I was highly principled. Uh, so when people called me a soap star or referred to me, and as they still sometimes do, veteran soap star now, uh, it it's actually I detest it because mm -hmm. it's 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 deprecating actually it's a it's a it's a it's it, it's minimizing and trivializing and I I don't like it mm. but uh, you know but, well it also it also denies the sort of breadth of experience and and also the breadth of thinking that you that you've done over your career where you've had to very carefully i guess um manage um a whole range of things <laughs> that, that that come at every actor because you know you can be you know asked to be doing noises off or doubt um, you know, they're vastly different plays and and yeah. TV is very different yeah. from making feature films and different to the process of, of rehearsal. It, you need to be kind of um, ambidextrous in a way with your sort of yeah. skills, really. Two, two things kind of happened. Uh, I had children. I have a son and a daughter. Um, my daughter's now in the 40s, my son in his 30s. He's been in America. He got a scholarship to Yale I'm happy to say and has done extremely well over there about to be married I can't go to his wedding sadly um, my daughter has two children so I'm a grandmother so uh, I've had a little bit of uh, quite a lot of life experience I had a lumpectomy I had breast cancer when I was 60 so um, and it wasn't the end of the world I'm, I'm a survivor I'm, I'm fine 
Um, but I had a lot of experience then of being a mother and a grandmother. So I decided to change quite, quite um, in a pointed way to change the way my career was going because I got very bored with being offered the same sorts of roles. So it was actually me who changed the types of roles I was being offered by producing, uh, and it started with that, by producing Love Child in which I was with my daughter at Griffin Theatre. Um, so and you, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about that? I wanted to ask, there's been a bit of a theme this week, actually, Belinda, when it comes yeah. to you. All of the theatre performers we've had this, this week have somehow worked with family. They've collaborated with their brothers or sisters or both. And, um, and so I'm, I'm really interested in this theme about what is it like to perform <laughs> in <laughs> and produce a play um, that Romy Bartz, your daughter, was yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the process and, and that project? Well, it all started because I thought, I'm sick of these roles. I'm going to be keeping typecast. Uh, you know, I played strong women. I was in Sons and Daughters. And, of course, that then sets a, a kind of precedent for the sorts of roles that are going to follow a hard-faced bitch who's got a lot of money and a corporate, you know, dragon. Uh, that was boring to me. A lot of these things, are, I mean, it was fun to do, but you can't keep doing those things. So I thought if anything's going to happen, and I've always felt this all my life, I've got to make that change happen. I can't wait for someone to do it. So I decided to produce Love Child uh, with my daughter who just graduated from NIDA herself. Um, and I learned how to produce a play. <laughs> they let me uh, put it on at, at uh, the Griffin Theatre because it was the stables then, but I'd just done a play at the stables, so they were very happy for that. My daughter was lovely to work with. Jennifer Hagen, the great actress, uh, directed it. And it was such a wonderful experience. We got lovely reviews, but my first thing my daughter said in rehearsal was, don't bung it on, Mum. I'm going to, you better be authentic because I'm going to know when you're not authentic. And I thought, oh, <laughs> Don't, she didn't want me to act. She said, I'll, I'll know if you're going to be truthful and authentic. So that was an interesting thing. But it, it was lovely because it was about a mother and her daughter whom she'd adopted out. But of course, as we know, wasn't actually her real daughter but it's and it was a meaty lovely play that changed the way people thought of me and then Jennifer Hagen who directed that offered me the part of in Shoehorn Sonata which was a real character role and all the roles since that time in theatre have been very character driven and way away from the types of roles that I'd played up to this date. So the last decade, really, even the last five or six years, I'd say about seven years, have been full of really wonderful, challenging opportunities, um, starting with Love Child, Shoehorn Sonata, da, you know, Doubt, Turquoise Elephant, um, people with accents, people with wigs, people very different to who I am, but difficult and challenging. And that was, that has been and still is the absolute joy, culminating in um, this year, um, sadly before lockdown with Beckett's play, um, Happy Days, which has just been was just a joy. And of course it took me three months to learn the lines. <laughs> so I'd been rehearsing and then of course we ran it, we got lovely reviews and then we were closed down. Of course, mm. with lockdown. But we're coming back, I'm pleased to say. We're, we're doing a return. That's Mainly because they, they can't get the set out of the theatre without <laughs> breaking it. <laughs> well, you know, you're already in there, aren't you? You're the, the show in residence wait, waiting to go for when it opens. Yeah. And I'm sure that when, when you are open again, we'll make sure that we spread the news yeah. far and wide that we can go and see you in yeah. real life and in person. I'm just wondering, just to, to close off, I know that um, that also you've got quite, you've, you've mentioned the turquoise elephant. And I also know that you're really very passionate about animal rights and 
um, also, I think it was, you told me um, about the plight of the rhino. Um, you've got a very, very big heart, Belinda Giblin, and it manifests in many different ways. Um, I'm just wondering, are there, are there other things that, that people don't know about you that they should know about you? Oh, I'm pretty neurotic. No, <laughs> aren't we all? Um, no, I'm very, um, I'm quite an intense person because things worry me. Uh, I have a great sense of justice. Um, and I, I suppose we all do, don't we? I mean, I don't want to make myself stand out there. I have a, a deep, deep passion for animals and, and people who can't look after themselves. It's very hard for me to walk past that. I've, I've saved animals, literally saved them and picked up birds that are dying on the footpaths. And I got the... the, the um, the fire brigade to come and rescue a baby bird that was hanging by its toe from the nest you know I mean they came with the sirens blaring it was embarrassing um but I I, I worry about all these things and I get involved with the Save the Rhino Fund I was involved with for a while I emceed a couple of their um a couple of their um, events fundraising events um I just find myself getting I find myself in these things uh, I don't go looking but uh, it's very hard for me to to look away I think that's how I would best describe myself and I'm always looking my mother said when I was born she wrote to her sister and I've still got that letter she wrote the day I was born she said Susie which is my first name by the way oh uh, yes there's a there's a one for the books she said <laughs> Susie, and she'd already named me, so she'd named me Susie Belinda after, Belinda after Johnny Belinda, the character in the book, in the book Johnny, in play Johnny Belinda. And um, she said she, she, she was born with her eyes open and she looked around the room as if, you know, well, what's happening? Where's, where's the action? What's happening? Where's the action? And I think, um, <laughs> I think that that's been uh, who I am. I, I'm, I'm just always looking. I'm, I'm always observing, looking, scared I'll miss something. So I think that's a that's an amazing it's an amazing way to be, Belinda, to always be looking and to be watching. <laughs> theater theater actually is about watching, isn't it? And it's about oh gosh, yes. thinking and 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 watching at all times um, and listening. But, yeah, <laughs> which I don't do a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> see I've talked too much not at all not at all I think it's such a it's been such a joy to even get a small snippet of um of who you are and and a little bit of reflection on where you've been I have to ask because I did ask my parents on the weekend I said if you could ask Belinda Giblin anything um and you were in conversation with them mum and dad back in my home country town what would you ask her and they said we would love to know if um, how Belinda was able to navigate the world in which she entered into in, in, in the film world and be able to keep um, true to herself during that, that period and navigate that very difficult period of, of um, I guess, life as a, as a young, young, blonde, blue-eyed <laughs> ingenue from, from Tamworth. Um, yeah. And I think that you've given us such a great insight into that. Uh, yes, I think I think looks deceive a lot. I might have been blonde and blue-eyed, uh, and part of that was my undoing. You know, I came from Tamworth, was a naive person, and wanted to be wanted to be glorious and beautiful, and I worked on it, and then <laughs> it kind of worked. But I'm still the same person underneath, and that is, I'm a pretty pragmatic. A, a realistic, fairly strong, self-determining woman. And that is very largely due to my upbringing and my parents and, and a pretty strong work ethic. Mm. And my father and mother both believed that you make life happen for yourself. Mm. You don't wait. You don't sit back and expect someone else to do something for you. 
I'd like to have done that, but it didn't quite work. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, Belinda. At the top of this, I listed, and that's only a slice. That's only a small amount of the work that you've done. I think your work ethic really does speak for itself. And I, I just want to read this comment from Virginia Gordon, who has written a brilliant insight into a phenomenal career. Thank you, Belinda, for the joy that you've given us over your career. Growing up in Tamworth explains so much about your attitude and energy and a privilege to have you talk with us tonight. And on that beautiful note, I'd like to say thank you so much, Belinda. It's it's always a joy to have you come and visit the, real, the Women's Club in real life, but it's been lovely having you in our virtual club this evening as well. Thank you for everything. And um, I really look forward to seeing you uh, again soon.